In this lecture, I'll be covering hybridization, bond angles, electron domain geometry, molecular geometry, molecular polarity, and the basics of the theory of hybridization by Linus Pauling. So in any case, let's start with beryllium fluoride, a weird chemical, and one that makes a shape little something like this. So beryllium bonds with fluoride, or fluorine, I should say. If you're going to do the dashing method, make sure you put the lone pairs. And this is an oddball chemical, as I've explained, because beryllium, if you check carefully, loves, in this case, only to have four total electrons. And that's kind of odd for some people. How can it want to have four electrons? You know, the fluorine, by sharing, feels like it has eight. We talked about that. You know, and, of course, I'm looking at the two valence electrons here of beryllium, if I didn't say that initially. Sorry. The 1s2 is not available for bonding, so these two electrons for beryllium are part of this bond here. So what do we do? What do we know? Well, the idea of hybridization is a way to try to explain what we know experimentally. Experimentally, we know the bond angle here is 180 degrees. It's half of a circle, right? So this is 180. The bond angles are 180 degrees. And we know that for certain. And we also know the bond energies, the energy it takes to break these bonds, are the same. And we know the shape is linear. These things we all know. The, the problem is, how do we explain that? So the geometry is linear. Also, electron domain geometry is linear. And let me explain the difference. Electron domain geometry is the geometry of where electrons are around the central atom. OK, and we'll explain that linearity. The, mole the molecular geometry is where the atoms are. So sometimes they're the same. And we'll talk more specifically when we get a better example. Polarity we'll have to look at a little, uh, little, little farther down the road. In any case, getting back to this, how can beryllium make two bonds that have the same bond angle and be 180 degrees? Well, if you don't believe in this idea of hybrid orbitals or mixing the orbitals, here's what we can say. Well, first of all, beryllium has two electrons in its S. This orbital is filled. There's no way it's going to make two bonds because essentially what's happening is there's, an elect there's two electrons that fit every orbital, and this already has two, so it's filled. So we wouldn't even expect beryllium to bond. So the only way to try to fix this is say, well, maybe with a little bit of energy, I'll just put a little star here, a little kind of thing here to represent that energy was absorbed, then this electron was absorbed to a higher energy level. And now, if you excite this right here, what we have is two electrons in two different orbitals. And what you have here is the ability to bond on both sides. So we have an S that has one, and we have a P that's one. Essentially, we have two different orbitals with an electron of piece, and that gives us the ability to bond, whereas the idea with two electrons in one orbital did not. But here's still a problem. This is an S electron. S electrons are held a little closer to the nucleus, on average, than the Ps. So therefore, these would have clearly two, two different energy levels. The S overlapping a P of an F would have a different energy of a P overlapping a P, the P of a BE, beryllium, overlapping the P of an F to fill these. So there's no way to understand that these bond energies, the energy it takes to break these bonds, would be the same if these bonds come from two different orbitals. So what we're going to say here is that what they do find out is when they measure the bond energies, they find that these energy levels are exactly uh, uh, in between or an average of these two. So the bond energies are the same and they experimentally are a mixing or a blending or an average of the S and a P. Okay, so it leads us to believe that maybe the S and a P have mixed. Now we understand that an S standing wave is a sphere. Okay, for those with quantum numbers, that is n equals 1, or if you want to deal with, in this case, n equals 2. And then you have the L number equals 0. 0, uh, zero you say, preferred, or 0 preferred axes here. It's a, a circle. Then we have a P orbital. And it's a dumbbell shape. It's got one preferred axis. That's why it's, it's, its quantum number is 1. But no, 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 if you didn't know quantum numbers, no big deal. Don't get scared. But two, an S and a P mix together, and two orbitals come in, and what you make is two equal orbitals. Notice the little tail at the end. That kind of is from that P mixing. Now, I didn't draw them very well, but this is an SP orbital, and this is an SP orbital. And now they're two equal orbitals. And we say, oh, again, don't 
quite know why you're hybridizing. Well, let me try to explain again. If I had an S that had one electron, and then I have a P who has another electron, how can they bond to make 180? Some people would say, well, why, those, why don't those electrons go to this P here, and we can bond on either side and make our 180? But as you understand, my friend, this is one orbital. Once you put two electrons in this orbital, it's not going to bond on either side. So P orbitals can only bond to one side. So if you got an F with its electron here, okay, bonding, we can't have an F on the other side of the P because that P is filled. It has two electrons already. So you may say, oh, well, what about the S? Well, if we have the S, and if we did this with the S, which would be kind of strange to begin with, certainly not going to give you the 180 bond angle. So the shapes that we know experimentally and the bond angles that we know experimentally and the bond energies all lead us to believe that these orbitals, the S and P mixed, and we call this hybridization SP hybrid, hybridization. So let me get rid of this. So the hybridization is SP. Now how do I know that? I know that because two pairs of electrons surround the central atom, okay? And if you were to tie two balloons together, here's an SP, and here is another SP orbital, two balloons or two pairs of electrons would repel themselves into a linear shape, and that's where this blue comes from. And then, of course, the F's electron would bond. Same thing here. Probably should have put an X there. So it explains the shape, the bond angle. And this polarity, as we learned, these are two polar bonds. And because of the linear nature, the dipole moments, knowing it's linear because two pairs of electrons will repel themselves in a 180 degree bond angle, and that's called valence, shell, valence electron shell repulsion theory, VESPER, okay, as we talked about. So that's called VS EPR theory. which means valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. And I like to make, I like to fill up my balloons to show you how these orbitals, this is one orbital, and this is a different orbital, how they repel themselves. Okay, so VSEPR theory just shows us exactly how these shapes exist, and it can only exist if they're the same orbital, and S and P will have different restrictions, won't flow like these will. All right. As we go through these, it'll be more apparent. But what you have to understand is SP hybridization always makes 180 bond angles, which means the shapes are always linear. Okay, let's go on. Okay, next one is this compound. An odd compound, again, but again, I'm just using it so we can understand. This is boron with fluorine. And we know something about this. We know that this makes a bond angle of 120 degrees. Okay, it's a third of a circle. We know that experimentally, and we also know experimentally the bond energies of all of these are exactly the same. Same problem. Now, if you look at boron, to bond to three different things, it has three valence electrons, but they have to be in three valence. They have to be in three empty or partially filled orbitals. This one's filled. That's not going to work. Okay? So just like before, probably this absorbs some energy, and an electron... Remember, I care about the 1s2, those are the core electrons, gets pushed out over here. Now, in truth, for those being perfect, these arrows would all face the same way, but don't worry about that. But now, if you, can, if you can see with me, we have three empty orbitals that can provide electron apiece to have three bonds. And I know boron's strange. It likes to have six electrons. Just goes to show you that octet rule you learned isn't exactly all-knowing and all-caring meaning that there are some examples and plenty of examples where the octet rule is not held. Here's an example, not what I'm teaching, I'm teaching you through that. Now, so we have three orbitals. We have an S that's spherical, we have a P that's spherical, I'm sorry, that's a dumbbell, and we have another P that's a dumbbell. And what happens is, in order to have three bonds, equal bond energies, that are somewhere between in strength, between an S and two P's, we're saying that these guys hybridized or mixed. Three orbitals go in, and guess how many come out? Three orbitals come out. Now, my 
hybridized orbitals are ugly. I get that. But these are called sp2 orbitals. Now, how do I know they're sp2? Very simple. 1s and 2p's. 1s and 2p's came together, and three orbitals, th two different energy levels, made the same degenerate energy levels. We would call this sp2. The one we just did was sp, and s and p came together to make just two. And two balloons, or two energy pairs, would repel themselves into a triangle, where in this case, three energy pairs, all right, here's the one, here's the two, and here's the three, repel themselves, not into a linear, but in this case, a triangle that's in the same plane. So trigonal, there's another word for triangle, planar. And this would be on the same plane. So if I have to pick this up, on the same plane, these are flat, and the 120 bond angles in between. That's the only way to explain the shape. Because if you think 1s bonded, let's try to draw that, there's an electron here and an f would bond to it, then you have two p's. Well, one p is going to go in, an, let's say, in a y direction, another p is going to go, let's say, in a x direction, and if you have an f and an f in the p's, your bond angles would be 90. Remember, on, the P's are three. There's three different orientations. There's a P Y, P X, and the P Z comes at you and into the board. So these things are all 90 degrees to each other. This is the same orbital. 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 So you can't explain the 120 bond angles with unhybrid P orbitals. Besides, how do you bond with the S in the middle? It just makes a funky shape that makes no sense. The bond angles would not, the bond energies would be the same. And again, the bond energies are somewhere between an S and a P. So the molecular geometry. Now, I just denoted what the, what the electron domain geometry, which represents where the electrons are around the central atom. Well, the molecular geometry is going to be exactly the same here. Because if you count where the atoms are, it's still going to be trigonal planar. And the polarity here is going to be nonpolar. As you probably could guess, three dipole moments equally dis interdispersed will cancel out. These three arrows, okay, plus going to a negative, as I'm showing you the dipole moments here, a lot going on here, would cancel themselves out. And this is a very symmetrical shape. Again, you have to understand a three-dimensionality to understand this. All right, now, in truth, though, there is another shape involved with all of this. And let me just clear up some room. I'm showing you the shape if all the fluorines, okay, were there. Now, what if I had a scenario where I had a lone pair? I can't have a lone pair with the 180 or the SP hybridization family. That's it. But here I can. And let me give you an example, okay? Let's say I have NO2 negative okay sounds strange okay let me let me draw it for you all right here's an n in the middle it has one two three four five valence then i have an oxygen and let me try to make this nice and clear okay so i have an uh, electron on top i'm just getting sloppy and one two three four five then i have an oxygen who has six? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, notice this oxygen by sharing has eight. And then this oxygen here has one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, notice it by sharing has eight. Notice if you look at the, um, the nitrogen, it has two, four, six, seven. So it needs an electron. This negative means that it gained an electron from its environment. Okay, no worries. You'll get to that. And it com comes here. It's kind of like a, um, an ion, and that's what it is. It's a polyatomic ion. It's a nitri uh, nitrate, uh, nitrite ion. In any case, this whole thing is negative 1. But in any case, if you notice something here, it's got a lone pair. Forget about the polyatomic ion if you've covered it yet. But this is a lone pair. How many pairs of electrons surround the central atom? Well, here's 1, 2. Now, this double bonding effect here, this is in the same plane, so we're going to just count one of the bonds. Because it's in the same plane, we're just going to count one of the bonds. The other bond's a pi bond, 
So in multiple bond scenarios. But the bottom line is there's three pairs of electrons. Therefore, it's sp2. And s and two p's had to come together to make this happen. So we would say the electron domain geometry is trigonal planar. But that lone pair, my friends, little ghost guy, all right, is not where an atom is. That lone pair, of course, is bending that pair downward. And we would say the molecular geometry would be, in this case, angular or bent. Remember, electron domain geometry is exactly for SPT, sp2, always trigonal planar, always three pairs of electrons. If there's a double bond, you just count one of the pairs in, its, in the same plane. That's if every place has a atom, it would also be molecular geometry of trigonal planar. Electron domain geometry is just where the electrons are. So if I just count this lone pair here and these lone pairs, it's still trigonal planar. Now, because the atoms of oxygen are just down here and there's nothing up here, we consider just where they are, it's a bent shape. Okay, so one lone pair is bent. All right, so in the family of sp2, you have two shapes, trigonal planar for the electrons, always electron domain geometry, and then the molecular geometry, if they're all filled, its molecular geometry is also trigonal planar, but if there's one lone pair, considering just where the atoms are bonded, it's bent, and notice this lone pair bends it downward. That's why we have to think about our VSEPR theory in terms of how these electrons repel themselves into a stable shape, okay? So very important. Let's go on. We're going to get a little faster now. Next one is carbon. This is methane. We've done this before. Carbon, if you're going to be dashing, we do this. Okay, it has... Now, problem with carbon, it's going to make four valence electrons and four bonds. Well, if we look at, look at this again, for a broken record, the S is filled in two Ps. So you probably can guess what happens. With a little bit of energy... This electron comes out to here, and look what we have. We have four orbitals now that can bond, and that's where the four blues come from, four bonds. Now, again, the four bonds are exactly the same strength. They wouldn't be if they were just an S and a P, so somehow these guys mix to have some kind of bond energy between an S and a P. But more importantly, especially in this shape, okay, you could explain this shape. Now, this shape is called a tetrahedral. All right, it's kind of like a tripod. This is going behind you, and this one going up. And the bond angle is 109.5. It's a very famous bond angle. And we know that experimentally. The shape of the four pairs of electron is a tetrahedral. And that's a tetrahedral family. Now think with me, an S and three Ps come together. So this is SP3. So an S and three P's make what? Four orbitals of exactly the same energy and size, even though I can't. And these are all SP3's. And how would four equal pairs of electrons, or four balloons, bend themselves? They would bend themselves in a tetrahedral shape. Okay? Sometimes it's drawn like this. You have um, this one. And this one on the same plane, let's do H and H. And then you'd have one going at you. This is going at you, the thicker one. And then you'd have one going behind you. Sometimes they'll draw it like that. And people like that or they don't. And that gives you the tetrahedral shape. All right, so that's one way of drawing it. These are in the same plane. This is coming at you. That's why it's getting bigger. And this is going behind you. That's why it's dotted away. But bottom line is, how many pairs of electrons are surrounding the central atom? There are four. That means an S and three Ps came together to make four equal orbitals of the same energy that can repel themselves into this tetrahedral three-dimensional shape. Now, it's important you understand, we know it's this bond angle. That is the um, experimental data, that 109.5. Try to think with me for a second how this would be otherwise. If I've got three P's, if they're unhybridized, here's P, let's say Y, let's make this PX, and then we have one coming at you, hard to do, that's the one that's right here, and coming behind you, this makes this PZ. 
All right, this is still px, this is still py. Don't lose sight that these are the same orbital. This is the same orbital, pz. Now think with me for a second. If I have three electrons, one, two, three, and then I have one in the s, is s is spherical, how would the hydrogens bond in a 109 bond angle if they bonded in the p's? This would at least be a 90 degree bond angle, but we know all the bonds are 109.5. We can't explain what we know experimentally. Somehow, besides the bond energy is all the same, this one would have a higher energy, wouldn't it, being closer to the nucleus? So to explain the fact that the bond energies are all the same, but, but guess what? Their strengths are, the, are a mixing of the S's and P's lead us to believe that they mix together and hybridized. Okay? So the molecular geometry, let's clean this up, is the geometry where the atoms are. Well, in this case, because I have all four there, it's also a tetrahedral. The polarity is nonpolar because this is a very symmetrical shape. It's not a flat cross. It's that tripod I just raced. And the, the polar bonds or the dipole moments would cancel out if they're all the same arrows. Now, I have to make this absolutely clear. In this family, there's two more shapes. Okay, so we have to cover that, which means there's some lone pairs. For instance, if you check out, uh, let's say, ammonia. Okay, ammonia is NH3. Here's an N. One, two, three, four, five. Each H brings one. Notice an the N has eight and H has two. And if you count pairs of electrons, one, two, three, four, we know it's sp3, four lobes, four equal. So we know that the electron domain geometry is tetrahedral. But where the atoms are, this is now different. This is the top of that tripod being pushed down. So because we don't consider where the lone pair is, it's a top of a three-sided pyramid. So we would call this, okay, trigonal or triangle pyramid or pyramidal, trigonal pyramidal or triangle pyramid. I don't care how you call it, but trigonal pyramidal is how we call it. Now this molecule would not be nonpolar. This is not flame. I mean, these three things are atop of a three-sided pyramid. So the arrows, okay, would all be pointing toward the middle of a three-sided pyramid, so they would not cancel because they're all bending upward, and you have an overall dipole moment of what? Positive going to negative, and this would be a uh, polar molecule. The partial negatives would be at the top of the pyramid where the N is, and the partial positives are at the bottom. You have to know your shapes. But notice, one lone pair, it's trigonal pyramidal. Okay, now we have another one in this family. Okay, another one. What if you got two lone pairs? Case in point. Let's say we have uh, hydrogen sulfide. I have sulfur and I have H. Let's pretend I draw it this way. S has one, two, three, four, five, six. Hydrogen has the one. And you notice sulfur has its six, has its eight by sharing. Hydrogen has its two by sharing. And we're, we're happy. And you might say, wow, that must be linear with two lone pairs. You have to think about the shapes. Remember, one lone up top, it's a, it's a, tr it's a, it's a, tr it's a tetrahedral. So we have these in the same plane. This is coming at you. This is going away. So it's, think with me. So make, make these, make, um, if you make these two the lone pairs, wouldn't, those loot, wouldn't this be bent, right? It's hard to do this without showing you, but if I make this a lone pair and make this a lone pair, isn't it going to bend these downward? Bent, aren't these guys bent on the legs of a tetrahedral? Right, so if you drew it this way, you may say, okay, this looks linear to me, but these two lone pairs sometimes are better drawn like this to show they bend those bonds downward. Still have four pairs of electrons, sp3. It's a tetrahedral considering where the electrons are, 
But this shape, these pair of electrons bend it downward into a bent shape. So this would now be an example of sp3 hybridization because of three of uh, what? One, two, three, four pairs of electrons, sp3, but two lone pairs, okay, would give you that angular or bent shape. Bent. Angular is another word for bent. All right. And this would be a polar molecule because now understanding the three dimensions, these arrows would be pointing, if you could understand the three dimensions, pointing upward. And these won't cancel themselves out. So the overall dipole moment is this way, where the positive is where the H's are and the negative is where the sulfur is. And it'd be a polar molecule because the dipole moments don't cancel. So you have to understand how the balloons repel themselves. All right. Now, sounds a lot going on here, but we can, in fact, continue this by looking at a, at a piece of, uh, of some notes that I want to show you from your textbook that can organize this for you. So let me show you where this is. It's in your um, uh, website, or I, or I printed it out for you, either one. We're going to go there next. So looking at our textbook tables, which is either in a textbook chapter 9, or you can just go from your website. I've, I've scanned these for your viewing displeasures. Okay, we can see that we have a couple different shapes. When we have two pairs of electrons, and the electron domains are two, we have, what we have is two electrons in each orbital, and that's a, this is going to be sp hybridization, always 180. When you have three pairs of electrons, and let's make these colors uh, stand out. So when you have three pairs of electrons around the central atom, it's going to be what? S P2. How do I know that? S and P is two orbitals. One, two. S P2 is three orbitals. One S and two P's. Three pairs. Notice it's trigonal planar, 120 bond angles. Okay, now with one lone pair, it's bent, but we'll get there. But these are the major electron domain geometries, always. If it's SP, the electrons are always 180. If it's SP2, the electrons are always going to be trigonal planar. Okay, and if you have four pairs of electrons, they're always going to be tetrahedral. And look at the bond angle. Why? One, two, three, four. This gives me SP3, four total orbitals are bonded, okay, equally and repelling themselves into the corners of a tetrahedron. Now there are more hybridizations, five and six we'll get to in a different video, those expanded octets. But let's go through this and let me show you uh, a little bit of hybridization here, another way to look at it. So if I look here, what I have here is 1s orbital and 1p orbital hybridized to make two equal orbitals, right? That's what happens here. And that'd be sp hybridization. sp2, as it shows here, is what? Two p's, here's p, let's say, x, p, y, and here's an s spherical come together to make three trigonal planar. If you keep going, here's sp3. Here's the s. Here's, let's say, pz. Well, they're naming it px, py, pz. doesn't matter. But these three orbitals make to make, what, four new orbitals and mix and make the tetrahedral family. All right, so let me just zoom in here. And this is what I wanted to get to, very important here. So when we're sp hybridized, this is s and this is P. It's always linear for the electron domain geometry. There's no examples of lone pairs, so it's always linear. Case in point, CO2. Trigonal planar. When you have three bonding domains, that's how many really hybridized orbitals. That's why it's SP2, right? Two and the 1S mixed together. It's the electron domain geometry is always trigonal planar. There's an example of BF3. I did that one for you. If you've got one lone pair, okay, like this lone pair, this lone pair bends this shape downward into a bent shape. If it wasn't there, it would be linear. It would be SP. So here's an example of that polyatomic ion I drew with a lone pair, and it's a bent or angular. So you have 
the molecular geometries are always going to be the shape of the family name, the hybrid orbital, the electron domain geometry. But if you've got lone pairs, we're considering just where the atoms are. And then sp3, if you've got four things surrounding the central atom, that means an s and three p's came together. We count one, two, three, four. And there it is, our tetrahedral shape for the electron domain geometry and for where the atoms are. Now, if we have one lone pair, like ammonia that I just drew you, one lone pair is the top of a three-sided pyramid, trigonal pyramidal. Notice electron domain geometry still is a tetrahedral. It's still sp3. And if I've got two lone pairs, case in point, like water, it bends it down into a bent shape. And that would be the shape of the molecule, where the atoms are. So the molecular geometry is where the atoms are. Electron domain geometry is just where the electrons are. So electron domain geometry of all of these is tetrahedral. The molecular geometry is where the atoms are. But we need to understand this three-dimensionality, okay, in VSEPR theory, VESPER, in order to figure out how they make stable structures or what is their three-dimensional structure to determine their polarity? This, of course, is nonpolar because it's symmetrical and because all the what? Dipole moments cancel out. Here, they do not, and this would be polar. So you're going to get this. We're going to chip away. This is just the initial segment.